we're going to look at, we're going to continue looking at update. Where we left off last time is we looked at sort of, and the British have a good word for it, bog standard. The most simple, basic, unordinary kind of update that you can possibly do. Um, but it doesn't take long to find a lot of problems associated with it. Let's bring it up and let's talk about some of the problems. We identified one of the problems before we left um, on Tuesday, and that is if I tried to, if I violated one of the database constraints, it blew up. Namely, if I put in a duplicate user ID, because I have a unique index on it, it wouldn't allow me to do that update, but it blew up spectacularly. It blew up with, a, with an error and all that. Now, when we look at these, you might wonder, gee, I thought this was a framework. Shouldn't it handle stuff like this? Well, it handles the very basic fundamentals. It's your job because it doesn't know, the framework doesn't know, um, like how you want to handle these situations. So it's up to you to figure out and implement it, you know. Um, it, instead of be, instead of complaining that, uh, Instead of complaining about what the framework doesn't do, be grateful what the framework does do, is sort of the bottom line, you know. Back in the old days, you had to code all this yourself. So let's bring up uh, the example we had last time and revisit the specific problem that we ran into and then go on from there. So to briefly look at the problem that we ran into, and if someone wants to get the lights set, Alright, if I go in here and log on, if you remember I had two user IDs, I had MLZ and I had DH. Now MLZ and DH, the user IDs, are not the primary key to that table, right? But we did create a unique index in the database. Why isn't it the primary key? Well, there's a lot of reasons. For one thing, numbers work good as primary keys because they can be stored more efficiently than characters. With a couple of bytes, you can store really high numbers, or with a couple of bytes, you can only store um, much less combination of letters. So. It, it, it's, it's, it's a more efficient way to store things, and as such, when possible, use numeric um, values. So, when something could be the primary key but isn't, it's called a candidate key. All right? For example, if you had uh, an employee table, social security number, um, or um, employee ID could be the primary key. Right? Both of them fit the requirements. Every employee has a social security number. Every employee has an employee ID. No one has a duplicate social security number. No one has a duplicate employee ID. So either one could be used, but you pick one. 
What would be the criteria that you'd use to determine to pick one? Well, a couple things. First of all, be absolutely sure that they both are really candidate keys. In other words, you know, um, validate, yes, indeed, everyone that is employed here has a Social Security number. That might not be the case. It, for Social Security number, it's pretty obvious, but I'm thinking maybe like with automobiles and license plates. When you first purchase a car, it might not have license plates. So like if I was a car rental company, I might think that the license plate would be a primary key, but it might not actually be a primary key because it may be that temporarily it doesn't have a license plate the, the, by the time I purchase it. So it could be the primary key. You want primary keys that don't change, typically. All right? You want primary keys that are short as opposed to long. And for all those reasons, if I had a choice between employee ID and Social Security number, so a Social Security number doesn't change, but it's, it's a long number. Likewise, if I was looking at an automobile, I might be able to use a serial number, but that's a monstrosity, right? That's, I don't know, 20 characters long, sort of, in that range. I don't know, plus or minus. I used to know that because I worked for a car rental company, but I, I don't remember now. And because remember, when you define something as a primary key, not only will it be stored as a primary key, but it will be stored every time you refer to that table. So a car rental company has a lot of other tables that point to cars, right? It has maintenance records. It has uh, contracts that, you know, where people rent cars. It has accident reports. It has all these things. So you'd not just be storing that gigantic VIN number, vehicle identification number, in the car table. You'd be storing in all the related tables, and that would be uh, resource intensive. So you would make something like a, an auto number, a car <coughs> number for that. All right, so anyhow, I log in, and I can go here, and I can edit it. If I were to put in a duplicate ID, like I'm going to go and try to change my user ID to DH. Now, you might say I shouldn't be able to change my user ID, and you'd probably be right, but for now, let's just go with it. If I click Update, Boom, I get an ugly error. Depending on how you have your web config file configured, you either get this kind of error or you might get an even less descriptive error when this goes live. In development mode, you'll get this kind of error that pretty much tells you what's wrong. But sometimes errors like this divulge too much about how your database is set up and therefore Errors like this are often suppressed through a web config setting um, when you actually put it up on the web server. So, we talked last time about different ways to handle errors and different ways that an update can fail. Let's sort of run down those and summarize and let's look at some of the weak points of what we have now. Number one, there could be an integrity constraint violation. So, um, or, or a, a database constraint violation. In this case, the violation was I tried to enter a duplicate user ID. So our database, good for it, caught that and didn't allow me to do that because that would be bad for our application. All right. The bad news is that my application doesn't handle the error very well. It just sort of blows up. Well, we want to handle it better. Other things that we talked about is potentially causing errors. What if I try to save it and there's no value for a required field? Whoops. What if I go and try to save it and there's no value for a required field? I'll get an error. What happens if the data is the wrong type? For example, maybe it's expecting age, and I type in Fred or something like that. All right, um, then would get an error. What if there was a related table? Like maybe in this case, um, there was a um, you know a link to the team that this player was on, 
and there's a drop down for the team. Well, I shouldn't be able to put in any team ID I want because what if I put a team ID that doesn't exist? I should be able to select a team from a drop down. All right. All these things are errors, and they can all be handled different ways. One way that we can handle an error is through validation. Ooh, I did not, it did not throw an error. Interesting. I mean, yeah, I must not must have messed up the database setup on something for that. So there's a whole slew of errors that could happen. There's another error that I didn't talk about, and that is, how can I say this? <laughs> It will be in a minute here. Um, there are unexpected circumstances. You know, you can expect there to be unexpected circumstances if, if that makes sense. Now, what, you know, is that a contradiction? No. You can expect that they will happen. What are, what's the exact nature of them? Well, we don't know. That's why they're unexpected, all <laughs> right? Let's say, for example, I went to update a database and the disk was full. And I tried to go and, and, and insert a new row or add something. It's not going to be able to do it. I can't anticipate when that's going to happen in my code, but I know that that's within the, within the realm of possibility. Likewise, what if, great example, I was doing database maintenance the other day and I had my database open, all right? and I went to update it. What if some other process had the database exclusively opened, all right, and I went to try to access it? Well, it would get an error. Can I expect when that's going to happen? No, but I know it's within the realm of possibility. Or what if the database server crashed or something like that? Anytime your application is talking to an outside entity, such as a database, if something goes wrong with that entity, that's sort of beyond your control. There's nothing I can do in my application to keep, for example, someone from opening up and edit the database, right? I, I can't do that. It is, uh, you know, it's, it's outside the realm of my application. It's out of my control. We're going to look at a number of strategies that we can use to handle these um, errors. One strategy we're going to use is to make our form such that it won't let errors happen. For example, if I had a Boolean field in my database, all right, that could only be true or false, I won't use a text box for that, right? Because a text box allows me to type in anything I want, all right? I could type in, you know, if there was, you know, um, had physical, you know, in this in this baseball database, has the person had their had their annual physical? That only can be yes or no, right? It's not like well they had some of their physical or they maybe had their physical. No, it's yes or no. That would be stored in the database as a boolean, and therefore we wouldn't allow a text box where they could type anything in. We could control that by having a radio button that was true or false, or a drop down that had yes or no. Or a checkbox where you checked it and that meant that they had their physical. You left it unchecked, that means that they didn't have their physical. All right? So by designing our form and using appropriate form controls, we can limit and we can eliminate certain errors. All right? We can eliminate other errors by putting validation. All right? So, for example, if a field is required, we can put a required field validator on it. If a field has to be a number, we can put uh, a validator on it to make sure that it's a number. If a field has to be within a certain range, we could validate for that as well. <coughs> so form design is one way we can present, prevent errors. Validation is a second way we can prevent errors. Then there's the wild card <coughs> of stuff that we can't expect like disk is full, um, database in use, those sorts of things. 
We can't necessarily write code to prevent them from happening, but we can write code to handle it better if it does happen. All right? And that's almost as good. You know, these are different ways to handle the errors. Prevent the error from happening in the first place. All right? Validate and check to see if an error is about to happen and keep the person from doing it. Or finally, let the error happen and then just be able there to clean up the mess. Now, in the case of this particular issue that we're looking at now, that is, I enter a duplicate ID in, all right, I could probably write validation to run out to the database and look to see if there's another person that has that ID. And if, they, if there's another person that has that ID, I can, you know, keep the update from happening. But you know what? It's just as easy to let the update try to happen. And if there's an error, I can list that as one of the possible or probable causes. All right? So that's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to write code to validate this. I'm going to write code to um, clean up the mess after it happens so they don't get that big, ugly error message, that they get a nice, user-friendly <coughs> message instead. So we alluded how we were going to do that last time. We talked a bit about how we're going to do that last time. We talked about associated with every database operation, there are two methods. One that is written in the present tense and one that is written in the past tense. So there's a method for the grid, or I'm sorry, not the grid view, the detail view updating. And that means that event is going to fire off prior to the update statement happening. There's also an updated method which follows the update. So after the database is updated, then this gets called. All right? Now, what we're going to do in this case is we want to look and see if the database operation succeeded. So because we're looking to see if it succeeded or failed, we're going to use the updated method. We're going to try the database operation, and then we're going to error report on it if there's a problem. So we have to try it first, so our code has to be after the database operation has been attempted. So the updated is the proper place to put this code, because we're going to try to do the update. If there's a problem, we're going to gracefully report the error as opposed to just letting it blow up. How do we know if the database operation worked or not? Well, we're going to know largely by this argument here to the function. This is part of the framework, remember. When a database operation happens on a grid, a grid view or detail view, after that database operation happens, this updated event gets called and it gets past two things. It gets past the sender and it gets past what we're interested in, the event arguments. The event arguments, if you want to think about it, are sort of the report, the status report about whether the update succeeded or failed. All right? This is what we're going to use. This is what we're going to test to find out if it succeeded or failed. All right? So how are we going to tell if it succeeded and, fa and failed? Those of you that have done some C-sharp coding probably have heard the term exception before and an exception being thrown. What we're going to do is we're going to look to see if an exception got thrown. All right? If it got thrown, an exception being thrown means that there was a problem. No exception being thrown means that there is not a problem. Everything went okay. All right, so if E dot, and we see a list of properties, exception is one of them. If there's a problem, this object will have something in it. This, 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 there'll be something in the exception object. There'll be something in this error report. 
If everything went okay, there is no error report because there was no errors. What we're going to do is we're going to test to see if this is not null. How do we test to see if uh, uh, an object is, is null or not? See if there's other syntaxes. Alright. Yeah, so that looks like the one to use. I sometimes get confused between whatever language I'm working on at that particular day. All right. So if the exception is not null, that means we have a problem. All right. So what am I going to do? All right. I have to do two things. All right. I have to do two things. One thing is, is I have to report that error somehow. Right. Now, we don't want that big old ugly error message to pop up, but we should give the user some sort of indication. So I have to report the error somehow. So I'm going to go back to this page, and I'm going to put on the page uh, an error label. is and I'll call it label error. All right. So I'm going to go sort of really bare bones here and I'm simply going to say label error text. equals error. I'm not feeling user friendly today. Right? <laughs> we'll come back and we'll talk about what you could put in there instead. But for now I just want to get the mechanism working and then we'll worry about the verbiage of the error in a second. Now, that should be obvious, <laughs> right? If there's an error, report it somehow. The other thing we have to do is every exception that gets thrown has to get handled by something, right? We had no code before to handle the exception. So who did handle the exception? The, the ASP.NET framework, right? So we didn't do anything to catch and, and do anything with that exception. So the ASP.NET framework did. Exceptions aren't going to get ignored. Someone is going to handle the exception. Could be us, could be the framework. We want it to be us because then we can control what happens. The framework only knows one way to handle an exception. Blowing up. All right, That's all the framework knows how to handle the exception. Because it doesn't know, is this a big deal? Is this a little deal? Whatever. So that's the only thing that the framework can do. We, however, we can, we can do whatever we want to. We could do a bunch of different things depending on the particular context of the problem. But we have to tell the framework, hey, I got this one. All right? You don't need to worry about this one. I've handled it. How do we do that? Well, there's
there's a property called exception handled, and we set that property to true. That tells the framework, don't worry about this error, I got it. All right, and therefore the framework doesn't need to worry about the error anymore because we've handled it. All right, let's run this and let's make sure that um, this works. I didn't want to do that. I'm going to go and set the start page to default.aspx. All right, so I go and log in. I'll go and try to change my user ID to DH. I click update, and boom, I get the error message. All right? So, my particular error message isn't very user friendly, but at least it didn't blow up and give a really ugly error. All right? This is something that we could probably do a little bit better job on. All right. So let's do a little bit better job on it. Yes? Uh, I don't know if you're about to say this or not, but can you make make it so it'll throw an exception per uh, data spot, I guess, if like you put in the wrong first name or unacceptable, could you make it throw an exception for that specific field? Um, that's a good question. Um, I'm sure you can because I always see like online if you're if you're on a website filling out something and you forget to fill in one of the boxes, it'll error out. Right. Well, well, that's that's just basic validation. Okay. That is it. And if you're going to do that, you're going to do that through validation. Oh, okay. I think. Well, well, we'll see what some of our options are in a minute here. Maybe that will answer your question. Okay. I believe no matter what we do, it throws the same type of exception, uh -huh. but it does give us information about specifically what the problem was. Okay. All right. So let's look at that. First of all, I'm going to get rid of that button. That button was just to demonstrate the log off and it bugs me so I'm going to get rid of it. I don't know what it means, it just says bug. <laughs> well if you were paying attention in class you'd know what it meant. But I don't All right? remember, it that was bugs. yesterday. <laughs> it was yesterday, really? I don't know, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Alright, so let's go and get rid of it and let's get rid of the code. Alright, so one thing I could do is I could anticipate the things that could go wrong with this from a database perspective. And I could put an error that explained that. So, for example, what could go wrong from this from a database perspective that I could not handle via validation? Well, what can I handle via validation? I can handle the missing fields, right? I could handle the data type. I could make sure that... Um, Things are within a certain range. Just can't make sure that the I just can't make sure the that, that there isn't someone in there for that. So what I could do is I could be clever and word my error to say something like possible error. Wait, maybe it's what fills in the name that they're trying to use and say it's already taken. Possible causes. And we certainly could do that. Yeah. We, could, we could certainly write code to run out to the database, look to see if there was that. But remember, in addition to handling that error that we kind of are anticipating, there's all those unexpected errors. All right. So I don't know for sure that it's a duplicate user ID, but I know that's one thing that I'm aware of. So I'm going to put that in my message. Possible, possible causes, a person already exists with that user ID. And again, now that I think about it, yeah, you could do that on a technical level. From a design level, I'm not sure if you want to say, like, you know. Because realistically, like, for what, the things I've noticed as a web user mm -hmm. is the only things that are really uh, verified database-wise are your password, making sure, because most people require a special care uppercase, lowercase, and a number down their passwords, and the user ID being different from everyone else's. So really the validation could handle your first name, last name, any person
personal information, street address, and things like that. But this error is really it's geared towards just those two fields. Um, that's what I've noticed. Well, but again, there also could be the case of the database being exclusively open, right. or the database being broken, or the server that the database is on crashed, or whatever. So there's all those uh, unanticipated errors. Right. So I'm wording my message, kind of giving the user a hint, you know, and maybe I could even say, try the update again later. If this persists, call, and then give Huffman's phone number to call. <laughs> <laughs> give him a number to some idiot. He'll do it for cheap. So now we'll go and run this, and we'll get a more descriptive error message. All right, so if I go here and I go to update this to DH, error possible causes a person already exists with that user ID. All right, so pretty nifty. All right. We will later on look and see Um, for inserting and, and deleting the same sort of code you're going to have. I, I talked like Yoda there for a second. <laughs> for insert and deleting the same code you shall have. All right. You're going to have the same kind of code for inserting and, and, and deleting as well as updating. Same idea. Certain things can go wrong with an insert that you can't check via validation. Certain things could go wrong the, uh, when you go to delete that you can't check with a validation. And therefore, we're going to, um, we're, we're going to look to see if it, if it failed, and if it failed, we're going to put up some sort of error message that gives possible causes. Now, there's another thing we could do, because the exception object that gets thrown has a bunch of information in it already that we can look at. What is the exception object? E dot exception dot. There's a whole list of stuff that we can look at for this object. There's a get type. There's a to string. I'm going to use a to string just to see what that does for me. It gives us some information. But I could do this, right? I could show this error when I'm developing, right? When I really want to know exactly what happened. And then I could change it to a more user-friendly error message um, when I'm done. Or I could give the user a user-friendly error message like we did before and log this error to a log file and review that log file periodically to see if we've been having database issues. All right? Especially if someone comes in and says, I tried to change my player information, but it didn't take. All right? We can then look to see, hey, did they forget to, you know, did they forget to click update and did they press cancel instead? You know, or something like that. Or we can see, yeah, there was a database error at that point. How am I going to log errors? Am I going to log database errors in the database? I mean, couldn't you technically make a, just a table of four errors messages? Could you? I would think you could. Yeah, you could. I, it makes me remember, and, I, and unfortunately I can't watch his films anymore, but it makes me remember uh, Woody Allen in, in one of his old movies. Shall we say pistols at dawn? Yes, we can say it. So can we? Yes, we can. All right. Is it a good idea, though? Uh, 
And you can almost you guess. Like that. Pardon me? Since you ask it like that. Since I ask it like that, probably not. Why is it not a good idea to log database errors in the database? It could get a big quickly. Because it could add up. Hopefully not. <laughs> Pardon me? It could add up really quickly and take up a lot of space. Hopefully not. Oh, yeah, hopefully not, but. There's a, there's a simpler reason than that. Uh, cool. If you logged those errors, you'd be looking at them at a later point in time. So would that be kind of irrelevant to no. if someone had a screw up an hour before or no, because if you're troubleshooting your site, if you went in and you got a customer complaint or you didn't get a customer complaint and you wanted to improve your site, you know, how do you know that everything's working on your site? Well, go run out, look at the database log. Did I get any errors? Yes, I did. Okay, what were they? Or no, I didn't. Yay for us. What if, the person, what if, what if there's an issue where, the, where the, the client can't connect to the database? If you can't connect to the database to update the database, how are you going to connect to the database to update the error log saying that you can't connect to the database? All right? So if there's a big enough problem with the database, you might not even be able to connect to it. In which case, trying to log that error in the database won't work. So you might put it out to what's called a sequential or a flat file. A sequential file is just like a text file, right, where you would just go and dump that information in a file, and then you can review it periodically. You know, it should be someone's job to look at that and, and determine. And again, you're right. The person that the database blew up on, they're out of luck, right? And hopefully your error message said, try again later, call customer support if this continues, whatever. But from your perspective, to try to figure out what's going wrong, you want to have a log of that, even if you're not there to fix it that minute. You know, you'd review this periodically. As far as it building up, you wouldn't let it build up, right? Because what you would do is you would look at the log to see were there errors this week. If there were, you'd look at it and try to figure out how to deal with them. If there were not, then you're okay. But in either case, you could clear out the error file and start again fresh this week. So hopefully you'd only have like a week's worth of stuff that, that you're getting errors on. There's other things, though, with the exception object. There is a inner exception. Let's see what that gives us. Nothing, because it gives us a syntax error. To string. Exception. Okay, that was not a good idea then. Um, trying to show some of the other possibilities that you have. Get tight. it could be useful, but I have a feeling it's not going to be in this case, because I think all database errors are going to give you the same exception. But with certain other operations, you can look at the exception and kind of get a better idea of what happened. I think in this case, it's just going to give me an OLAY DB database error, which it will give me regardless of, of the issue. Yeah, I, 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 I've never I, clicked that before, so I've been afraid of that. I don't want to click anything. Yeah, no, no, no. My whole thing's going to blow up. Forget it. Yeah, there. I think every database exception you get is going to be one of those. But again, depending.
depending on the particular operation you're doing in other contexts where you're testing for exceptions, the specific kind of exception you get can be meaningful. I guess I would stick for formatting my own user-friendly error message, at least during, uh, at least in production, maybe in development, display the system message, and then if I was interested, logging the other errors. Yes? Is that exception that we just saw, though, is that specific to what <coughs> errored out? Does that have any? No. So I couldn't put if? No, you, message this. no, you couldn't. In other words, any error that I would get writing, t updating a database would give me that error. It's universal. So, yeah, so so it's not, it's not going to give me a specific error if it was a duplicate key or a specific error if it was a required field missing. But it would be nice if it would return like some sort of code like a one or a two or something with the codes. Yeah, yeah. Um, and again, it's possible I'm missing an attribute, but I don't believe there is one. Yeah. That's where I would go, you know, Bill Gates. Error. Possible cause. Your imagination for user ID is terrible. Duplicate user ID. At least there we've tipped them off probably what's wrong. You know, an error message ought to give the user a best guess as to what's wrong. And, and tell them what they need to do to correct it. You know, so you could say, if you have not entered a duplicate ID, try again later. You know, because maybe the database had just crashed or whatever. How would they know if they entered a duplicate ID? Well, the if, they change their, if they change their ID, and that was the only thing they changed, and they got an error, that would get me to thinking, maybe that was a duplicate. All right? And if not, oh well, they try it again later, they still get the error, you know. Maybe we create an entry in the database of how many times they tried to change their ID to a duplicate ID and then just delete their account at a certain point because they, they're, you know, they're annoying. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. Now. So that's one way that we can take and we can elevate this from just the very basic bare bones functionality that that provides. Again, the idea of a framework isn't to do everything for you. The idea of the framework is to give you a building, building blocks, give you a starting point. And again, it doesn't know what you want to do in case there's an error. So it leaves that part of it up to you. All right. It handles it. It works. You'll give your user ugly system errors. Most of the time, we want to do better than that. So therefore, we're going to write our own code for that. Now, another thing that we're going to have to take into our own hands and do something about ourselves is validation. Right? There isn't anything built into the framework that allows us to validate. So, for example, Regardless of how I have the database set up, and I think maybe I forgot to make the first name required, but they need a first name, they need a last name. Oh, no, they don't. Yeah, they actually don't. <laughs> well, again, I, we, we discovered this earlier, right? That's what I said. Regardless of what the database said, they need a user, a uh, first name and last name. What if, like, Prince or Madonna or Cher want to use the... Then they can't play in our league. <laughs> All right. <laughs> then you put in dot 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 or N A or something. All right. So the bottom line is, is regardless of how the database handles it, this is one thing that we can write validation for. All right. This is one thing that we don't have to let it blow up. It didn't blow up, but that's actually a bad thing, right? We still, even if the database didn't blow up, we still want to require a first name and last name. All right? So what do we do? We have to put validation on there. Let's try to put validation on there the way that we've been doing it so far. I'll give you a hint. It's not going to work. So I'm going to go and I'm going to drag a validation control over. Say required field validator. And I'm going to click on that. 
And when I get to control to validate, nothing there. You have to go in the control to do the validation. The reason it's there is these text boxes are situational. These text boxes are not there all the time. These text boxes are only there when we're in a certain mode, when we're in edit mode. If you remember way back when we first did this, and I can, we can go back to that, There's a default mode for edit. The text box exists when I'm in edit mode. When I'm in read-only mode, there is no text box there. So I can't go and put a validator for that text box, because that text box really is only there some of the time. All right? So how do I handle this? This is what's going to get into what are called template columns. Here's an easy way to think of template columns. With template columns, it's when you want to do something to the form that's different than the bog standard, baseline, basic, default behavior. What is the basic default behavior? Well, I'm going to show a label when I'm in read-only mode. I'm going to show a text box when I am in edit mode. Now, in this particular case, text box is fine for all these fields. If we had a has physical, yes or no, we might want to use a checkbox instead. All right? So that would be another case of where we would want something different than the default behavior. But we definitely want to validate first name, and that's not default behavior. We want to validate last name, and that's not default behavior. So we need a way of changing the default behavior. You can do that by going into Edit Fields. You can pick the field that you want, first name. And I'm going to click Convert this field into a template field. All right. What does that do for me? That allows me to go in and edit the templates. So, for each field, there are one, two, three, four, five templates. There's the item template, which is what we're going to see when it's in read-only mode. In this case, in read-only mode, it's going to put it in a label. And that's fine. That's what we want. Alternating item template. Um, this is probably more for grid views than for detail views, but what you can actually do is you can like stagger things so that you don't read a block of stuff going down, but you can, you know, you can alter, you can change the way that alternating rows look. There's an header template, there's an insert item template, so when we're inserting into this grid view, what's the template? And finally, there's an edit item template, and that's the one we're interested in. Alright, so I can click edit item template, and that shows me that right now, when I go into edit mode, this gets a text box. Well, that part's fine, right? We wanted to get a text box. What's the part that's missing? In addition to the text box, we want some validation to occur. All right? Now, in other contexts, we might want to get rid of the text box and put something else in instead. Uh, I don't know if we'll have a chance to do that today, but we'll definitely do that on Tuesday, where maybe we want to put a checkbox there, or maybe we want to put a drop down there, or something like that. All right? But in this case, we want to edit the template by adding to it a validation control. So I'm going to go and I'm going to drag the validation into that edit item template. 
And now I can go in where it says control to validate text box one. That's text box one that's part of this edit item template. And then I can configure the error message to say must enter a first name. Where does it say what? Must enter any first name. Where is it going to say that? Is it going to say within the text box itself or next to it? Well, it, 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 it's just like it's just like a validation control that we used before. Okay. It, it'll be it'll be part of that um, part of that um, Thank you, Jacob. Yeah, part of that entry in the table for first name. Okay. So let's run this and see what happens. <laughs> so now, it, it let me say that before with that, but now the validation is in place. So I can type in my name. And save it. We remember this one, don't we? Missing something in my config file. You should just put that in a notepad and put it in its own folder. Actually, I make this mistake every week as a constant reminder to you <laughs> that you need to put that in the web config file. So you ought to be thanking me. Thank you. You're welcome. I just can't ever find it. I've done it myself so many times already. <laughs> it's a custom errors default right there, isn't it? Your system dot web. No. Oh, that's web debug config. Open the wrong one. There we go. So that's like an ASP.NET bug, an ASP.NET 4.0, 4.5. I would describe it as a bug. They'd probably say they did that on purpose. Just like I said, I did it on purpose. I don't think they did. You know, I that read. Was fixed. I read. <laughs> I read in a non-IT article the statement: "It's a feature, not a bug," which is always a joke that that developers use when they made a mistake but don't want to admit admit it. <laughs> it is a variation on the Pee Wee Herman. Again, we're coming back to Pee Wee, right? When Pee Wee fell off his bike and goes, I meant to do that, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. But it, the, the funny thing is, is how much IT has um, has infiltrated our culture as a general. Uh, in general, I would have never expected to read that statement outside of a software developer talking, you know? So that was interesting. I, I also like when, it also kind of bugs me when people use IT terms that way, like if, if someone says I don't have the bandwidth to handle that, you, you don't have bandwidth, you have time, right? I don't have the time to handle that. Don't tell me you don't have the bandwidth to handle something. Oh, you never, never did? No. Well, you got to remember who I talked to, right? Well, no, not really. Um, a uh, bandwidth is is how much you could deal with at any instant in time, all right? All right. And and therefore, when people casually use the word, I don't have time to do with that. That means that they can't handle that within. They can't handle the extra thing, along with all the other tasks that they're doing. So yeah, it is sort of a bandwidth issue, <laughs> but I still don't like it. All right, let's log in. And I'll go here, and I'll try to not enter the... Notice how it still updated your database, though, even though it errored out. Yeah, it did. Yeah. Interesting.
interesting. It was supposed to do that. All right. Not a bug, it's a feature. And now we get must end our first name. And if we do enter it, we get the update. All right. Now, we'll have to put some other pages on this because I don't like the fact after I update it, I stay on this page. After I update it, I should go somewhere else and maybe see what team I'm on or whatever, but we'll worry about that later. All right, let's review the two main points about this. Or, or a couple of the main points. There might be more than two. The first main point is the basic default behavior of this kind of updating is typically too bare bones for production sites. In other words, it's going to be very rare that you can simply take the default behavior and run with it, right? Because it doesn't do any error catching, it doesn't allow for any validation or anything like that. So there's a good chance that no matter what you're doing, you're going to need to somehow customize this default behavior. All right? What are the two ways that we can customize it? One way is improved error handling. All right? We let certain database errors occur, and then we report them more gracefully. And that was accomplished via the updated event. Remember, there's going to be a past tense version of inserted, updated, and deleted. That is code that's going to run after the, 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 the update deletion or insertion has been attempted. All right? We can look to see if it worked or not, and we can report our errors more gracefully. All right? Report the error and tell the framework that we got it covered. So that's what we're doing here. We could add code here after the update to redirect them somewhere else if it was successful. All right? We could put an else here, and if it did work, we could send them somewhere else. All right? And we'll probably do that in a, in a future example. So that's the one way we can customize it. The other way we can customize it is by the use of template columns. And with the template column, that allows you to go in and tweak the default appearance and behavior of different columns um, there. So we need a validator for first name. We would need to do the same thing for last name and any other field that was required. Just like validating it um, on, on the kinds of forms that we did at the beginning of class. Now one thing that's a little aggravating is when we get around to doing insertion, we have to go and we have to create another template column, or we have to go and edit the other template column for inserting. Yeah, it's a little bit of redundant work that you have to do, but, you know, that's the cost of using a framework, is that, you know, it's, be it's still better, you're still better off than writing the entire thing from scratch. All right. Next time, we're going to... We're going to play around a bit more with template columns. We're going to add something in that is not a text box, but requires a drop down, let's say, or a check box or a radio button or something. So we'll do that. And then we'll get into inserting and deleting. All right? Just a quick question back on how you handle that exception. Uh -huh. I forget if you mentioned this or not. Um, so all that, the methods of updated, right. updating, handle that exception there because you just have a uh, try catch block and you establish that okay that, that's a good question um, the question was is, is could I use a try catch block instead of the technique I, I am doing and the answer is what would you put the try catch block around all right the actual updates for this details view is not in my code. It's on the private page. 
Because the way you're doing, you'd have to put that try catch around the code that's firing off in real time and all that, right? Well, well, let's back up. I'm sorry. What did what did you say? Your when you establish that, it's in the defaults. Well, the default page is doing the login, right? So we could put a try catch around that, which I think we did. Or not. I don't think we did. Okay, we did not do that. So yes, in this case, to do the, we could put a try catch around this code that does the logging in. But that would just handle the entry of the user ID and password. You could put a try catch around that. We can put a try catch around the, up, the, the code here because our code isn't actually calling the SQL statements. That's code into the framework. So we can't wrap our try catch around the code that exists in the framework, so we do the next best thing. We let it do its thing and then look at the results and, and display a message that way. So that's a, that was a great question. That was my question when I first looked at this. It's like, well, this is just a try catch. And it's like, okay, I'll put my try catch where? There's no place to put it because that code doesn't exist here. It exists up in the framework. Other questions. And these events, keep in mind, these events are like wired to the framework. In other words, if I simply associate, <coughs> I associated, show this. I associated with the details view the method on item updated. So the framework knows, hey, after the update happened, this is what you do. And the framework is wired to know what arguments to pass it and all that. We just need to identify which, which of our methods is going to handle that particular um, event occurring. All right. Oh no, did you just delete your first name? <laughs>